All right, in this video, we're going to begin the unit on cnidarians and tenophores, and we're going to start by talking about cnidarians. Most of this unit will be cnidarians, which is a fancy word for jellies, and then we will talk about tenophores, which is a fancy word for comb jellies, um, though comb jellies are decidedly less uh, well-known than jellies. All right, so a couple things to talk about. Um, uh, all tenophorin, well, all cnidarians are diploblastic. And by diploblastic, what we mean there is two tissue layers. They have an ectoderm, which is the outermost tissue layer, and an endoderm, which is that innermost tissue layer. You can see there the uh, comparisons to the triploblastic um, organism that also has a mesoderm. And so um, during a development, the the cnidarians just don't have that inner layer form. They kind of just uh, form over during that process of gastrulation, which they form that kind of squished in ball like you see there. Um, and that forms that those two tissue layers, the endoderm is essentially their digestive system and the ectoderm is like their nervous system and their um, outer covering like a, like a skin sort of thing. Uh, cnidarians have radial symmetry, which means that they have multiple lines of symmetry. Most cnidarians are like spherical or not spherical, but um, round or circular in shape. And so they have multiple lines of symmetry like you see there. All right. So um, the phylum cnidaria, just a couple terms or things about them specifically. Uh, the Greek word here means nettle which is kind of like a, a like a briar or something like that it comes from the fact that they most cnidarians have stingers it's probably the thing that they're most famous for uh, they have these specialized cells called cnidocytes uh, these are basically uh, cells that are their stinging cells where their barbs are uh, the different types of cells that are this is what makes them unique from other phyla um, they have inside those cells a, a structure called a nematocyst, which you can kind of see there. It's like a little harpoon. Basically, you can see there on the right the electromicrograph of that sort of thing. So it's it's pretty it's pretty nasty looking. Um, you know, it kind of sticks in you and and attaches and hangs in there. And the way that these uh, cells work is they're almost like little mouse traps. They um, they just kind of spring, this little touch sensitive area here kind of springs open and lashes out at their prey, and this is how they catch them. A um, couple other characteristics. They have the longest fossil history of any animal, more than 700 million years of fossil history, um, widespread in marine habitats, uh, some freshwater habitats, mostly found in warmer waters, not so much in the colder waters. And so you find a lot of them in the tropical areas. Um, they can be sessile or modal, depending on the stage that they're in. And some live a completely sessile lifestyle and some have both lifestyle. Um, some of them have floats or sails even to move. So like they kind of float on the top of the surface and are able to move that way. Some of them just kind of float about. So here's a picture of the sails. These come from like a Portuguese man of war, which we will talk about um, later. Some of them are able to live symbiotic, symbiotically with other animals. Symbiosis is just means living together. You know, of course, the most famous is the clownfish and the sea anemone. But you can see there the um, that jelly with all the fish surrounding it, basically eating off of its uh, leavings. Um, they can form commensal relationships also with other organisms. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, like a, a mutualistic relationship with some sorts of t organisms like algae that can live on the surface or in the tissues of cnidarians. Um, they are reef building. Some of them are reef building, meaning that they actually build structures. Um, this is like corals and that sort of thing. And um, they can provide habitat for lots of other species. There are four classes of cnidarians, and here they are. There's the anthozoa. Um, this is the largest class. This is like anemones and corals. They tend to be a sessile group. And then there's a hydrozoa. Hydrozoa is one of the most variable classes, meaning that it's um, 
There's a lot of different sorts of things in there. Cubes are, are cubozoa, are cube jellies, and they're given that name because of the, the structure of their, their body. Uh, it has like a square shape to it. And then cyphozoa um, are what we would think about as true jellies. This is what we are typically would think of when we think of a, of a jellyfish. All right. And then um, there's this idea of dimorphism. Uh, dimorphism is basically when there's two morphological types during the life cycle or two shapes. Morphological types is just a fancy word for shapes. Uh, they can either be found in the medusa form, which you would see on the right or on the left, or the polyp form on the right. And the medusa form is typically what we think of when we think of a jelly, this kind of dome shape with the tentacles facing downward. Uh, but a lot of jellies are also uh, the basically the opposite of that, where the polyp shape, where this basal disc attaches to some sort of structure and the mouth is facing up on them. Uh, a little bit more about the polyps. So don't have it. Let's just look at this. This is, a, this is an example of a polyp form here. Uh, they have tubular bodies, which you can see there. Uh, the oral end or the mouth is facing up and it's surrounded by tentacles. So you can kind of think of it as like an upside down jelly that helps. Uh, they have an internal cavity called, and this will be the same for medusas as well. Golly. Um, they have this gastrovascular cavity, which is kind of like a stomach, but it also uh, helps for circulation as well. So it's not a true stomach. And you'll note that these organisms do not have a digestive tract with two openings. They just have a mouth. And uh, it also serves as the anus as well. And it's kind of like um, this area where things just go in and slowly dissolve. But it actually works as a circulation system as well. You can see that very well here on this polyp. And so this um, gastrovascular cavity, very important in structure. The ab oral end of the polyp is typically an ab oral, just means the opposite of the oral. It's typically attached to some sort of structure. And so as far as reproduction, uh, asexually they can reproduce through budding. Here is um, this picture that is just so good. You know, here's this is actually um, a hydra, uh, which is something that is in this unit. And it produces a bud, and then bud becomes independent and detaches from his parents. And so that is asexual reproduction, but um, this can also happen through, or they can also reproduce sexually. Uh, let's see, I want to go one more thing on budding. There is something that they can, um, they can have multiple, multiple um, polyps are multiple buds coming out of the same polyp. Um, it almost looks like they're stacked on top of each other. You'll see this with, uh, we'll talk more about this in a later video, but they're, the little medusas are stacked and it releases those polyps into the environment as part of their reproductive structure. Uh, so the medusa stage is something that is very familiar to us. This is kind of what we think of when we think of a jelly. Uh, they, it's, it's typically referred to as a bell shaped structure. And so they have the bell, the, the, the kind of the curved area there and the mouth is found on the concave side of that bell with tentacles extending out. And some tentacles can extend very far into the deep. They have certain kinds of uh, sensory receptors. They have structures called statocysts, which give them orientation and they have ocelli which function as light receptors.